Welcome everyone uh, to our uh, FANAC Fan History Zoom session. Uh, today the topic is feminism in 1970s and 80s science fiction. And we have with us uh, some people that are very well equipped to talk about that. So I am going to ask everybody to introduce themselves and talk a little about their background and to tell us how they got into fandom. So let's go alphabetically. Uh, Hi, Janice, would you, would you please introduce yourself and, and tell everyone how you came in? Uh, I was born in 1950. I started reading science fiction in 1955-56 with the first book called Janice in Tomorrowland. Um, I can't really say that I was a fan until I was in graduate school and we founded SF Cubed. And the first WISCON, which we first discussed, I, me, Hank, and Phil first discussed the first WISCON in, uh, uh, at a, a convention with the Extension Outreach Coordinator up in Minneapolis, um, probably about two years before we had the first WISCON. Um, and uh, I shared with Jean the first um, uh, science fiction course that was taught in the comparative literature department at UW-Madison too. Um, so all of those things are kind of connected together. Plus, I worked in this bookstore. And um, we actually started putting up signs in the bookstore. So everybody probably had a different origin story and intent for their interest in science fiction and in women in science fiction. Uh, but mine was partially uh, from, uh, I also have four college degrees. and. Um, uh, so kind of parallel to the people in my college degree telling me programs, uh, telling me that science fiction was trivial, I also was working on this Wisconsin stuff and SF Cube stuff and various other kinds of book reviewing and writing and stuff. Um, as kind of, for me, it was kind of a counterpoint and I was kind of impelled by the uh, the writings of uh, people like, no, I can't remember. Shoot. Anyway, I'll, I'll come up with it later. So anyway, I think my first real fan convention was Chicago, uh, was a, a Chicago convention. Do you remember what year that was, Phil? What, what was that? Chicago, the first time we went to Chicago. 1977. 1977, I guess, is my first, besides the making of Wiscon and the attempts to do New Moon, and which used to be, I'm sorry, Aurora, which used to be Janus, Janus, Janus Aurora, then my my offshoot was New Moon, the group's offshoot was Aurora. You, you, I don't you, know, you, that's you, probably you, enough. You went, very to literary you, went to World, you went to Worldcon, Jen, um, in Kansas City earlier. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's right. Because we had that big panel or we had that big dinner with all. The cool thing about the women writers at that point in time is that not that many people were talking to them. So we got this entree, <laughs> you know, into what they were doing. So that was like, yeah. I don't know how much of that was intentional and how much of it was accidental. Because uh, well, I've COVID, been involved in feminism for a long time. Go ahead. Well, we, we want to go to those stories um, in detail, but Let's go through sure. the rest and, and get some introductions. Jean, why don't you talk about how you came into fandom? And I was I was born very close to Jan. That was in 1951, and the class that she and I took was incredibly fun. It was the the first time the University of Wisconsin had a science fiction class. The administrators didn't think it could possibly attract many people, so they had Fanny Lemoy, the instructor, be make it a, a, a symposium. I think there were 18 of us, but then they were shocked by the number of people who signed up for the wait list. So that was the last time there was a tiny, small science fiction convention, uh, science fiction um, class. And in fact, we ended, the 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 reader, the science fiction readers are in that symposium ended up adding a huge number of titles to the to the list that Fanny had on her on her on her her list, which scared the uh, the graduate students who weren't science fiction fans out of the class, some of them. But anyway, a couple of years later, Jan and I met at the at the at the the science fiction group meeting at the at the 
at the book co-op on State Street and started Janus. But I don't think I knew I was in fandom until after we published the first issue of Janus, because that's when that's when Hey Clitrell told uh, told me that we had published a fanzine, and I had to ask what that was, because all I thought of was movie uh, fan type magazines on newsstand. But that's the, my first experience in, at a convention was, was I think Minicon, not really Minicon, but although Worldcon was the bigger, it had the bigger effect on me at Big Mac in Kansas City. Okay. Lucy. Okay. Well, I'm a little, little later to the story because I was born in 57 and I didn't really, I was reading science fiction and fantasy from elementary school forward, the Lord of the Rings was what pushed me into the fantasy genre. And I, I, I just read everything in the li library. Then I discovered the science fiction book club and saved my allowance for that. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I went to university at the UW, University of Washington, ah. <laughs> different state, <laughs> that I, I uh, took my first uh, women's literature course and it just blew my mind completely. And I had known I was a very feminist little girl all along. So I was completely fed up with boys having all the fun in the SF adventures. But then I realized, oh my gosh, women are writing science fiction and they're writing them about women. And I need to read this stuff. But it's the mid seventies and I'm in school. And so I'm a little busy and I don't know about fandom until 1981 when Janice Murray, an mm -hmm. active member of Seattle fandom, found me at my desk at our mutually boring job uh, reading Philip K. Dick. And she said, oh, you want to meet some other people who read science fiction? I was like, yes, same. And, and I met fanzine fandom right off the bat. And it was, it was sort of mutually fascinating. So, um, and then we were very lucky to have some interesting female science fiction writers in town at the time. Yeah. Yeah, which I guess we'll talk about later. <laughs> so, <clears throat> these are all very different origin stories. Yeah. Mine is mine is fairly uh, traditional. I started reading like Lucy did from an early age. And then uh, I'd been reading at the back of the, the digest about all these conventions going on, but I couldn't afford to go to any. So I was in grad school and, and I, I finally um, found fandom uh, two ways. One was yeah, by getting a real job and having enough money to go to Worldcon. And then secondly, because Harlan Ellison was coming to town and, and was going to do a talk. And guess who else was at that talk? Other fans. Mm -hmm. So through things like that and, you know, sticking a feel well bumper sticker on my car and waiting to see who showed up, I, I found fandom. So a little bit different. Uh, let, let's talk now. I, we've already touched on how um, feminism and, and fandom sort of got conflated and mixed for you guys. Let's, let's, um, Lucy, why don't you start this time? Uh, you, you <clears throat> said that in college, you found out that you were a feminist. You didn't know that before. Um, how did, how did that influence your fandom? How did it show up in your fandom? When you met fans, did you think they were, how, how did they act around you? Were they better or worse than the regular population? Speak. I uh, knew all along that I was a feminist, but I didn't know it had a label. So I discovered the label in uh, my, I guess, freshman year and said, right, this is what it is. Okay. Um, and I, I guess I don't know what question to address. When I got into fandom, I had already tried to take on a course of reading. Um, the I, I think I read March Piercy. Um, Cece McKee Charnas, where is my list? There were a number of, of easily accessible Fonda McIntyre um, science fiction feminist novels out there, but I didn't have a lot of money and wasn't buying books at the time. So it was whatever I could get. And I was like, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life is books by women about women and their experiences. And a lot of what I was reading was pretty angry and I too was pretty angry because I was fed up with the way I was treated by the society I lived in. What was delightful about Seattle fandom at least, which was my first experience and certainly has continued since then, was that um, 
I did feel treated differently because I was female, and I felt that the men were much more aware of feminism in general. And and I what I think was most important to me now looking back is that I did not experience any of the gatekeeping about fandom. Fanzines is what I fell into. And people just fell all over themselves, men, to help me understand the fan history, read cool stuff, you know, go see cool movies. I didn't have to prove anything. Whereas in real life, I was constantly being harassed, you know, to prove that I was really good at what I said I was good at, or um, not to complain about not getting paid as much as the next person, not to complain if someone was shady <laughs> at work. It, it just, it, it felt so safe to be in fandom that I felt embraced. And embraced it in turn. That's that's a wonderful thing to say. <laughs> I feel lucky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Jean and Janice, you you uh, kind of came in together, right? You were in the same class, and and you uh, worked together on some of your early fan materials. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, who? When did you said that it was Hank? I think Hank Luttrell that that told you you were you were a fan after you did your first fanzine. Say some more, both of you, please, about those early days and the people you met and and how how your your um, how how you blossomed into fandom. And then well, my, I, I want to hear about about your fanzines too. Well, my my feminism came well well before getting involved in the science fiction group, and I'm sure that Janice is, Jan did, did too. Um, I was involved in in several groups during college. Um, dare defend abortion rights group and uh, women's transit and I took lots of classes and I was had been pretty radicalized and pretty angry as you were Lucy that would that I think I think you almost almost have to go through a big stage of anger before you get me before you become a feminist because all all of a sudden you just see how things are that's that's bound to make you angry but I think the the formative thing for me that brought together famine feminism and fandom was Big Mac the, the 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 panel discussion that Janice referred to that was designed by Susan Wood. Um, she got a very small room for that because again, the idea was the 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 the, 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 the people who read Big Mac didn't really think that this was going to be a, a very attractive panel on romantic science fiction. But by the time I got there, there wasn't even any standing room. I was standing on my tiptoes outside the door trying to hear what was going on. But luckily, there was a big lounge outside. And were you there, Lucy? At the at Big Mac? No. Okay. But uh, lots and lots of people came out there, and the the conversation outside the room took twice as long as the actual the, the, the panel did. And out of that came the the, the a women Zappa. And for me, out of it came out of the reason that the, the thing I most wanted to do with Wisconsin is is to be to make help be involved in a convention that had more than a single women's women in science fiction panel and is and it certainly had to do and it, it certainly really energized me in terms of what we did what, what when we started Janus together and 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 well it, it lasted for uh 20 years and it, that it, that continued to be the most important thing that I did. The was the Madison group was really unusual. As as you said, Lucy, I, I didn't didn't perceive any gates because we I think the science fiction group in Madison was outside those gates. We okay. it wasn't until uh, after we published a few issues of Janus that I realized that we were unusual being a women dominated group. And both Jan and I think Jan and I have, we're both fairly strong personalities. I suspect we just attracted more people who were like us, and probably turned away other people unknowingly that would have preferred the more traditional kind of fan group. They even started other conventions in Madison yeah. Yeah. and Milwaukee as a result, yeah. which is yeah. fine. You know, I went to those too. Right. So, so. Um, I referred earlier to supplement this conversation to the fact that most of the time I was working on SF Cubed and WISCON and the fanzines. I was also working through graduate degrees in a field called comparative literature with a minor in Chinese. 
So at the end of that, I was a full professor, but being the ba a baby boomer, there wasn't a teaching job out there for me. So um, I was continuing my activities while working in libraries, and I eventually became a full professor by working in academic libraries to the point where, just to you know, pull this story forward, I now teach, even retired, I'm 73, I teach in the honors program. Last semester, I got to teach for the third time a course on Octavia Butler, who um, was an acquaintance. I can't really say I saw her or interacted with her enough to call her, to be able to call her a friend, but, you know, we did have some contact. And um, I'm teaching, again, this coming fall uh, on um, uh, Tolkien, which is my third kind of career area, where, um, and I always was following the idea that I was better off uh, hedging my bets. So I never really saw myself as a compared to literature scholar, maybe as a science fiction scholar, maybe as a Tolkien scholar. And um, I just want to tell you this funny little anecdote. I, I also attended many professional or quasi-professional conventions on science fiction and fantasy on science fiction, on science fiction and fantasy, and on medieval studies. Um, the medieval studies intersected with Tolkien. The science fiction, that's my husband uh, doing his exercise. He's um, recovering from um, uh, not COVID, another illness. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, so I was always trying to hedge my bets between these different uh, professions, and I ended up as an academic librarian. But what what I was discovering along the way is that you can actually kind of remake, as we were remaking science fiction fandom to include women authors and women's ideas and feminisms, I was remaking my librarian job to include a lot of these other things. Um, I worked in uh, a total of three campuses over the course of my career. So anyway, um, getting back to the women in science fiction, for me, it wasn't just about fandom. It was also about slithering in, you can't see my hands, I'm slithering into the academic world and infecting it with uh, legitimization. And also, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the theorist Michael Foucault, but I was always kind of interested in his idea that you could, and this is important for my interest in fandom, that you could uh, you could communicate with people somewhere between the written and the spoken word. And what he meant by that was you could be more casual um, and still achieve um, mind-expanding intellectual content and you could be less casual by infusing that content. So between the spoken and the written word. Um, and um, so fandom had places you could put that in. So for a while, we were also running on parallel tracks at World Science Fiction Conventions, we were running an academic track. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the Science Fiction Research Association, the International Association for the Fantastic and the Arts, in medieval studies, we could also do academic papers um, that were theoretically uh, interesting and stimulating to people who might not be in the academic world um, at Worldcons. And in fact, um, one of the papers I gave at a Worldcon in uh, Arizona eventually became uh, my dissertation, and it was on different women writers and how they intersected with the feminist community. So um, for me, fandom was this like constantly this counterpoint to the, the um, and, and I know this is different for other people, to this denigration of popular fiction. Um, I could tell you lots of stories about this, but it even, which was even happening to me when I was a librarian with people, you know, denigrating the whole thing. Um, an academic librarian for a couple of universities, three universities. So uh, uh, Jean and, and Janice kind of built their their group around them, right? You said that some people went away and did something else because they didn't like the direction it was taking. And Lucy was talking about how safe fandom felt. But all of you went traveling to other groups and other conventions oh, yeah. 
do you think, can you say a little about your experiences on, on the outside? You know, was it different uh, when you weren't with your close friends that already knew you? How, how did you feel? Did, did you feel safe there too? I felt pretty welcome because we'd already had several issues of Jadis that had come out. And so I was meeting with people that I'd been corresponding with for a while. I think I think that's the most one of the most wonderful thing, thing about fandom during the 70s and 80s before um social media and, and and email even is that we wrote these long, long letters and frequently I I I going through my records to write this book I've been writing. I, I was just stunned by the number of letters I wrote during this time because that was the only way we contacted. And so when once you've establish those relationships in the fanzine and the, the Janus and publishing letters and articles by other people and then all the letters i i i was just ecstatic getting to meet all these people at conventions and I, we went to a lot of mini cons because it was close to madison and we went i went to most of the world cons for pr pretty much a decade um I, I i felt really really close to the people in seattle and San Francisco. I think the, the 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 fandoms there I felt were most um complimentary to how the Madison group ran and and and, and our interests in feminism too. So. Yes, I was lucky because after meeting fandom, I felt encouraged to actually leave my hometown of Seattle and I moved to San Francisco. Uh -huh. And it was it was hard but the fandoms were so similar and everyone was so welcoming and right. it was about 30 times as large <laughs> so there were all the splinter groups that i never knew existed like con runners and costuming fans and i can't even tell you what all we all take it for granted yeah. Yeah. There are so many there are so many diverse aspects of being interested in speculative fiction and media mm -hmm. but uh again no gatekeeping Lots of welcoming. And for me, what was important about San Francisco fandom at the time, which was 83, and I lived there until 89, uh, was that so many of the mover and shakers, movers and shakers, were women. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I joined the Emperor Norton Science Fiction Hour television show <laughs> by <Wow. laughs> my future co conspirators before Corflu, uh, Shea Barsabe and Alan Cadogan. And there were men involved, but they were running it and they were paying for it. And it was shown on a, uh, it was actually a half hour show, it wasn't an hour. But we, we reviewed fan scenes, we reviewed movies, we talked about novels, and it was on public television in San Francisco. So we were in the studio recording it. That was before Core Flow. Did you join the Women's Zappa? I did. I was in the Women's Zappa for a while. I can't I didn't remember. Okay. I, I mean, it wasn't long. I, I didn't find Appas were ideal. Uh, for me as the participant, because I'm just lazy. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, everyone finds, and I got this idea from someone else who I no longer remember, or I would give them credit, but I, they said, you know, everyone finds their own speed in fandom. And I think that's true. For me, fan scenes were great, except it took so long to get responses when you publish. Yeah. And so when we could publish them, and also it took a long time to type those dang things on Gestapo yeah, yeah. technology. <laughs> As it improved, um, I think my my fan act just settled on fancy phantom. It became a con runner and yet I, I helped start a convention. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I didn't go to a big convention and meet general fandom until the 83 Baltimore Worldcon, mm. which is where I met Avedon Carroll and she convinced me to stay on instead of going home. And then you did Rude Bitch, right? And we did Rude Bitch. <laughs> that was an yes, excellent bitch. Which bench. we'll get to later. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, I guess maybe what I should kind of admit publicly here, I'm not muted, am I? No. Nope. Okay, good. Um, is um, I suffer from a couple of complications. And one of them is imposter syndrome. And it's been with me my entire life. So I'm never quite sure what I'm doing is important or worthwhile or whatever. So um, that may color how uh, we talk about some of these things, but I didn't do a lot of fan writing. Um, even some of the stuff that was published in Janus and New Moon uh, and Aurora is being used for other things. Um, and so I did publish 
hundreds of book reviews, hundreds of reference book articles on uh, women in science fiction or children's literature in science fiction, uh, medieval studies on all that other sort of thing. That's the kind of writing I was doing. Um, I can't say I'm doing that much now as well as editing. And um, so I think, but we kept going to these conferences and it was, um, it was, you know, it, it's like I was getting the gratification there. And I think some other people have talked about this, that even though I didn't feel like I was ever really a part of anything, because that's just me, um, there was all this gratification from these people who said, wow, that's interesting, or gee, I'm glad you're doing that. Or even sometimes they would say, um, you can't talk like that, or I don't agree with you, or get out of my face, or, you know, it was still a stimulating conversation. And I've had that said to me by some pretty famous people, actually, <laughs> which is fine with me. They also say it to me in medieval studies and Chinese studies. Um, but the other part of this for me, interaction of this was discovering Chinese science fiction and Chinese fandom through a couple of people. So that now when I go to China, I'm invited to lecture there about Tolkien and about women in science fiction. Forums like this one, where people really want to hear about what's happening here. And then they tell me about what's happening there and they send me their books. And, you know, um, so um, it's kind of an unfortunate situation there right now, but I won't go into that. Uh, but um, um, I think part of the reason we have such different origin stories and fandom stories is that we are all hooking things together that otherwise may not have been hooked together. You know, so bringing groups of people in, like people from the Mythos Peak Society who also belong to Utopian Studies, people from Utopian Studies who also belong to Medieval Studies, you know, that for me, I'm sure it's other things for other people, but it, this kind of inoculation metaphor for me where I'm trying to inoculate all these groups with feminist stuff, and they are providing me, uh, you know, so the information I get and the ideas that I'm pursuing don't necessarily come from fandom, but some of them do. And I remember in the early history of fandom, uh, there's a guy named Tom Moylan, who's involved in utopian studies, who kept telling us that Wiscon was um, very important because of that function of of bringing together communities rather than isolating them. And uh, I still remember when, um, who was that editor um, who passed away relatively recently, who predicted that Wiscon was gonna be over in five years because it was no longer needed. And of course it David did. Hartwell. David Hartwell. Thank you, fellow David Hartwell, um, who's now passed away, unfortunately, but we, yeah, we, he was a guest of honor at Wiscott a few years after he said yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing was that I always had this kind of love-hate relationship with him. And I'm not exactly sure what it was about, but I think it's because we both had comparative literature degrees. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there was some kind of tension there about what he saw it as and what I saw it as. But I could never really have a decent conversation with him. Yeah. There was always this underlying tension. You know, you know, when you talk about Jan, two different words that you have that we put together, I think the most basic word was feminist and science fiction. For so long, I would use that phrase among, well, relatives or friends who didn't read much science fiction, and they'd look at me like I'd I'd, may, I'd embarrassed myself, like what the yeah. hell is that? So it it, it was pretty basic. And, and now now those two words are commonly heard together but but we bet when we started that it was it was not not a common thing yeah but the, just to give you a little example of that the, the third time uh new moon or uh, uh, janus was nominated for a hugo award okay it was for a british science fiction convention and they actually tried to get us off the ballot that, that was actually what they were trying to do is get us off the ballot who were they and what did they do? I, uh, I well, you don't so, remember? No. So what you, this was in the, the 70s? Yeah, it was, it, but it was, uh, what, when did 79? we get nominated for Hugo's? I should probably look that up. Uh, all right, all right. I, I was looking for, for 77 through 80. So 1980 was the, the, the World Con in, in Britain. 
70 and that was the third time in a row and we were the for all of those years we were the only women edited fancy to be nominated for hugo's but i don't think anybody tried to get us off the ballot oh yeah they did there were there i i i got i got a letter from a prominent fan who urged me to withdraw my name because feminist fan, science fiction fans had obviously block voted but i didn't hear <laughs> from it. i didn't hear from any um officials legislator or the uh, officials from the convention oh okay yeah i don't know okay. about you guys but i failed to get the message that we were all supposed to be <laughs> black well we also were constantly told that um that like when cyber became famous that women weren't women in science fiction was old and you know it just goes on and on like that and you and you i mean half the books that i taught in my feminism and science fiction courses or in my introduction to science fiction courses um have been made into movies or tv series or whatever recently so and yet we were being told during all of those periods of time that oh it was over and wiscon was over and nobody was interested and yes feminism has morphed a lot but so has feminism and science fiction morphed a lot so um you know but but looking back is so different from what the experience was at the time and of course i have all these insecurities so you know we all, we all have plenty of the insecurities okay. <laughs> uh, we're with you we're I, I don't you know everyone who doesn't have imposter syndrome you know hold up your hand okay. uh, so yeah. so we're dancing around it so why don't we just go to um uh, talk about the origins of, of janus and, and wiscon and then after that lucy i want to talk about rude bitch which was oh, at the time right so uh gene and, and janice tell us you how why did you start janice what was the triggering event well, and, jan, uh, jan, jan was at the first couple of meetings i i wasn't she she had started it out before i got in but i had been involved in a feminist reading group because i i I couldn't, I, I had left college, but I missed school. <laughs> it, was, it was a very sad case. And so I'd started this reading group and I thought we were doing such cool things. I, want, I wanted us to publish something. And somehow none of them was interested in writing any more term papers. They thought they were through with it. So the, I think, I don't know if you did it, Jan, or, or, or Hank Luttrell or Phil or something, put an ad in the Badger Herald in the a Madison student newspaper that you were putting together a publication. That's when I walked in. But, oh, okay. But so you you had at least a meeting or two before that to talk about doing doing the fanzine. Y yes, I worked in this alternative bookstore. And um, we, when Hank and I, and my husband, Phil, he wasn't my husband at the time, but that's another story. Um, when we started talking about fandom and, fandom and fanzines, um it and then we had the first sfq meetings we put up little signs all over the store too so that was another impetus is sfq was, was much later that was that was when dick russell joined the group and he got was. incorporated so sfq didn't exist back then yeah right but it, the that's sf group yeah and it wasn't called sfq but we put these signs up and that's how people ended up coming and a number of them actually were from like Diane Martin and Richard Russell and a few other people like that nope, nope, came in nope. after the class. Nope, nope. They, they they didn't come in until after Janus six or seven. The, the, okay, are we just talking about Janus? Okay. Fine. Yeah, you at the at the beginning of Janus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you you must have put the ad in. I guess maybe there were, were were there were posters, but um, so there was just a, there was a group of maybe eight nine ten of us I think I think John Bartel I think yeah. John Bartel was part of that that too yeah he he was involved in the early Wisconsin too early Wisconsin so that's my connection to Wisconsin I married John Bartel <laughs> so so you never attended one I went to one Wisconsin that was out in the sticks oh so, yeah so the south southeast this isn't yeah. exactly what I thought it would be it was bad yeah but anyway, with the back back then, when when Janus got started, we, uh, Hank Luttrell had a mimeograph machine. He was um, a Hugo-nominated editor of Starling, and he 
he helped us get this 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 magazine together was what we called it at the beginning and then weirdly people started sending us letters telling us giving us reactions to our articles and and um, none of them seemed to want to buy a subscription which i thought that would be how we would we would manage to make this go and so it was that's that's what hank told me that that we were a fanzine and that that, that we would subsist on ego boo and not subscriptions and i for for me doing janus was 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 my gateway to becoming an artist actually i i i, I started drawing i did a, I, I did writing too and everything but by the end of i'd say 10 years doing doing artwork and janus writing doing artwork for other fanzines i i found my career i i, I was hired as a graphic artist and so i i i dived deeply into the convention into into the janus it was like my my main reason of living jan had a huge life outside of outside of janus and incredible responsibilities and i but i just focused everything on that fanzine it was um out that and, and Janus six, I think, was when we switched to offset. That's when Jim, that's when Dick Russell and, and Diane Martin came in and got us incorporated and straightened out and our straightened out our finances a little bit, took it out of the shoebox that we've been keeping it in. And um, oh. <laughs> and uh, and and we we started getting our fancy our fancy published by a, a offset press that was owned by um oh god, what is his name? Brian Yoakum, who oh, yeah. really, really liked giving to the community. And so he let the whole group come in after the fanzine had been printed and we would do collation. And he would let us use his big stapler, it's like, it's the, the stitcher, to, to, to staple it. Unfortunately, Brian liked to keep all of his invoices in a big paper bag and expected his customers to pay him on time without notices. And he didn't his business didn't last very long so we lost a, a patron there and then we went on to somewhere else but we stayed doing offset which i think i think i think uh, estranged us a little bit from the fanzine fan community because we we'd left the um the traditional method the traditional reproduction methods behind but I loved it. The more the more control I over I had over what the the, the fancy looked like, the more the happier I was. Um, and one of the fun things about because we had so, so many competing agendas and perspectives on what Janus was going to be, and we had like massive, I would say, almost classical arguments about what was going to be published and what wasn't it was extremely time. useful all the time extremely <laughs> useful what do we accept what do we not accept is um um that's why i think it was so dynamic is because you know when i've looked at other fanzines they go one direction or the other but for a number of years we managed to like not garrote each other but still <laughs> have total disagreements about yep what was going on it definitely um, had a personality that was lost when we went into it as a co-op of aurora yeah Good yeah stuff, but it lost the personality well it did it oh interesting yeah because then i went off and did um something called new moon mm -hmm. and um it was way too far well i mean i can't say way too far it was far towards um academic writing and it was kept actually purchased the uh, an example is it was purchased and to go in the rare book room at the University of Wisconsin Madison, um, whereas Janus was purchased by the public, public library, who didn't want new one. So um, it gives you some idea of what Janus that became Aurora. Anyway, um, I, sh I, sh I should I shouldn't put it down. The, the, the Aurora Aurora was a great fanzine, and, 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 and Diane Martin was the chief uh, editor. It just uh, the 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 personality change was obvious it changed into something else yours your yours and my interaction jack was uh added a flavor i think that um i didn't i didn't appreciate as much as i i do now i i didn't either because i i uh, you know took took it as you know the way you do when you're younger it's like an impugning your character and um competence type of thing 
Well, you had so much stuff going on. And I think, I think when I was pushing the deadlines and say, Hey, I could work, I could work 60 hours this week on the, on the fanzine. Why can't you? And I was probably not, not helping your, your sense of, of, uh, uh, being able to get things done. So that, that was, that was, that was an issue towards the end. Well, while all this was going on, the the school and the other conferences and Wiscon and Jan, uh, Janus, I also had jobs. Exactly. Sometimes I had as many as four jobs. Yep, I was typing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So 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 let's um let's talk about Rude Bitch for a while, and then let's go yeah. back to Wiscon. Yeah. So Lucy, tell us the story of Rude Bitch. The story. <laughs> I mean, if Avedon Carroll is involved, it's like co-editing with a volcano. Really <laughs> I mean, we didn't argue. It was not like that. I mean, it's just that we had so many ideas and so much we wanted to say, and we would just sit down in front of the computer and say, okay, let's write some shit. <laughs> um, both of us were feminists. Both of us were really tired of the boys club that did exist in uh, fanzine fandom. Not so much interpersonal, but if you got a fanzine and it was by a guy, it was all guy things mostly not always uh, but as in general we were like man there's no women's voices prominent and so let's write about stuff that we care about which in our case was let's rate the single men in fandom and so we did uh, we were just having a hilarious time in the basement at her mom's house in uh, where she was living i was living in falls church renting a room from ted white who imparted much fanzine history and wisdom and so forth um, while I was living there. And then I would go up to Avenon's and we would spend some time saying, all right, so both of us are single. What are our choices? And we just got more and more uh, realistic about (laughs) what different people had going for them. But it wasn't, it was in good fun, but we also were a little surprised when it actually got published and it was in 83 um, because we were talking about not just, oh, is this guy hot, but male bias in fandom, watch out, we're here. You just don't hear from a lot of us, but we're willing to step up and say some shit. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think it was very shocking, but it got shocked responses. I mean, we didn't get hate mail, but we got mail from guys saying, well, I don't think you should talk about things like that in a fan scene. We're like, why not? <laughs> why not? And uh, I mean, a few people were amused, of course. It got a generally good response. But oh, Mike Glickson, I think, oh. basically wanted to write us out of fandom. <laughs> Horrible, really boot stomping, ball crushing women. <laughs> like, what? Damn straight. Oh, man. Uh, so it, it seemed like a feminist attack, and that's not entirely wrong, although it wasn't meant to hurt anyone's feelings, but we were really tired of always hearing about the male perspective. I seem um, to remember a comment about it that people said this, that they didn't realize what women talked to uh, to one another about when guys weren't there, and it came as a surprise. That's right. <laughs> I mean... As I said, it didn't seem so amazing to us at the time because that's how we spoke. Oh, yeah. What about things like that? <laughs> too short a run. Um, and, and we just did two two issues of it. Rude Bitch 1 and 2. I was a word of them. Yeah. And I think they're both up on Fan Act for those that haven't read them. Please read them. <laughs> it's an historical <laughs> retro <laughs> document now. When men were get... shocked that women have thoughts about them <laughs> with their own. Or, that, or women talked about other things than men, too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we would totally pass the Bechdel test. Yes. And they just couldn't handle it. So, <laughs> I thought it was great, though. So, so Diane I... Martin has a comment in the chat, and she says that additional context is uh, Russ's oh. uh, How to Suppress Women's Writing was published. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I I wrote a an article, an open letter to Joanna Russ, sort of reacting to that. Now I that that I love that book of Russ's, and if if I if I ever am famous for 
for any length of time. It'll it'll be for that article. I keep getting requests to get it reprinted, which still surprises me. But Jan referred to the, that idea a little while ago about how during the late eighties, um, feminism stopped being so popular because it was popular for a while. During the seventies, it was the in political uh, rallying point. But it got less popular, um, and there was a lot of criticism by pe by people who that who thought more the the seventies science fiction had been really really boring, and it's time to just kind of clear the slate and start over again. And well, the U.S. was getting pretty had been getting more and more conservative in its right. politics. Blu so. Bluey had just written backlash, and that that also fit into that that story where where mm -hmm. the where the where the people now felt it that feminism were was fair game as a as a target. Yeah, yeah. So Lucy has mentioned uh, the response that Rude Bitch got. Uh, tell us about the response that uh, Janus got. Well, as I said, one prominent fan did write us a letter. I think prob this was probably after the first time that that we were nominated as best fanzine. I think at the same time I was I was nominated as best fan artist, and uh, seriously urged me to withdraw our nominations because obviously we didn't deserve it, and the only reason we'd been nominated was because of block voting on the part of of feminist science fiction fans. <laughs> Was that the only negative comment that you ever well, received? There, I would say this. This is not Janus, but when Wisco, after Wiscon won, Wiscon for a while got got a nickname among um, among some science fiction fans in the Midwest. I think Glickson was among them who did the Relaxicon in Michigan a lot, and they called Wiscon PervertCon because we we included panels on on gay, lesbian. Um, gender issues at, at the convention. I got pretty used to it. Um, but what 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 more more happened more often than not, rather than attacks, was assumptions. Obviously, if we were a feminist convention, we didn't allow men. And obviously if Janus was a feminist publications, we wouldn't publish men. But so people were saying these things without looking at our table of contents or looking at our list of guests of honor where obviously this wasn't true, but somehow, you know, I suppose that that old idea that if you if you have a group of people and there's a, a small number of women in a, in, a, in a group that would normally have all men, the estimates of the number of women in that group is much higher than it is. So I think that's what was happening was that we were so unusual that people went, people's assumptions went to an extreme. And so that, that was the thing I think of most often uh, argued against. Um, I, very often, I, I guess personally, I got comments like, um, "You feminists just don't have a sense of humor. You're just, except for you. I don't mean you, Jean. You're, <laughs> <laughs> but that sort of thing. We, mm -hmm. I, I most, I mostly just ignored it. I was having too much fun. It was so easy <laughs> to upset men." <laughs> That's a good yes. Is it still? <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't. Yeah, it is. And, uh, <laughs> after we became irrelevant, we became relevant again, and it's so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not that there weren't feminist men doing feminist things. Oh, there were. There of were. Of course, there were. So we don't ignore that. But and many of them got angry when I wrote that uh, uh, the uh, open letter to Joanna Ross because I talked about how how feminism in the 70s wasn't being talked about it at these these panels about feminism of the 70s or I'm sorry science fiction of the 70s science fiction of the 80s whatever and I said none of we're not being we're being we're lost we're not being talked about and all these men who used to write for Janus well you don't mean me do you I I I value that so you had to yeah I'm sorry Lucy yeah, I had so to do that Tell, tell us about Wiscon and how it got started in the early days. Again, Jan is there at the beginning. Well, the first actual forays happened at a minicon. And we uh, there was an administrator in the extension outreach in Madison who was interested in not only doing a science fiction convention, but one of the earliest things I wrote with my mentor 
was a course book of uh, extension outreach course book on uh, introducing science fiction and so in talking with him hank and phil and i took him to coffee or something and asked him about a convention so the first three wiscons were held through the auspices of the university and that kind of gave us a chance to see what it was like and you know what kind of constituency we work and not not have too much financial responsibility because the other thing we haven't really talked about is wiscon was started out of the pockets of people you know the financial part uh, who didn't have any money you know as i said i was working many jobs and so um there wasn't really any financial backing initially so much to our surprise as time passed started to accumulate money but um uh uh so he he bankrolled us and we didn't really kind of like that eventually because there were certain rules you have to follow if your extension outreach and then also because they pocketed all the money that it didn't cost to run the convention um and uh so we were having a conversation and he said yeah he could support that and so we started in that, that was 75 76 and then 77 we started in and then we had a lot of discussions about who our guests of honor would be and um uh and how to me what they were partially is discussions of how we might break the mold of only having male you know only male writers were important and we didn't really need to do that because we weren't trying to play on a huge stage or anything and then very soon we became known for that and people started bringing their classes to wisconsin their um uh, you know academic classes to wisconsin and we richard uh russell arranged for us to for them to get um uh teaching outreach credits i don't know what they were called but continuing education credits so you could get continuing education credits which you had to do if you were a k-12 through teacher um so uh wisconsin just seemed all along like a win-win situation but it was uh initially started on a, that that's my husband Phil Pavity going by who was involved in a lot of this say hi Phil hi <laughs> um anyway um so basically I was talking about the the origins of Wiscon both the financial and then kind of the you know what I talked earlier about what some of my ideas were for Wiscon and what some other people's were one of my big influences was a woman named um uh, who had been a friend of mine since high school in the Eau Claire area, but down in, she was down in Madison too, Karen Axness. And she was always coming up with these long lists. So she decided at a certain point she was only buying books by women. I wasn't at that point yet, but um, but she always had these long lists of, of books we should be reading. And I have to say, some of the books she suggested to me changed my life. Uh, Philip Pullman, for example, was one of the ones. But I mean, there were lot of but we had all these we were like this it seemed to me a magnet for these core resources and it started almost immediately you know it was like the world had this big hole in it and everyone was holding their breath and all of a sudden we were breathing in and there was Wisconsin that's what it seemed to me at, like at the time it was so incredibly validating scary but validating um, you did it well, and when you do things well, then then you then people come. Well, my husband was at the time because you know I talked about these insecurities. He he told me something that I've used for my entire life. He said, Janice, there are some things so worth doing they're worth doing badly, and what he meant was I was always trying to have the perfect moment, and the perfect moment never really comes. So you just got to start. So oh, that's, that's what he, when I first knew him, that's what he kept saying to me. Or he would say, it's better to do something than nothing, which is how I finally finished my various of my graduate degrees, because I was always afraid I wasn't perfect. But anyway, the whole point is, to me, Wisconsin represented one of those things where you're at the right place in the right time, and you're doing something you don't know that is very valid, but all of a sudden it's like, you have ignited a moment and there are all these people interested i don't know is that gives you some idea um i haven't found anything quite else like that um uh aside from 
the Tolkien stuff. But oh, and women in China, I got some people really angry at me at the way I talked at con uh, medieval congresses about women in China. But that's another story. We had uh, several advantages by being with the with the university at the beginning. They let us have our convention in um, the the um, what is it called? With it's it's the it, it's the pie Lowell Hall. Lowell Hall. No, no, that's that's the hotel area. Yeah. The okay. Sorry. Convention was was in the um, uh, is it, they had a big convention area, so we got that absolutely free lot like, right know, downtown we, Madison we, near the university big huge spaces overlooking Lake Mendota it was gorgeous but then we also used Lowell Hall which was um sort of a dorm structure unfortunately for for con convention parties it was difficult because you had to walk at least a block and a half from the convention center to the the um to Lowell Hall and it was February <laughs> The, the the second year when Octavia Butler was there and we had a, a blizzard, she had to walk between the two buildings wearing the only pair of shoes she brought along, a pair of high heels. And oh dear. It was it was it was very difficult. And also the Lowell Hall had a lock on every floor. And so if you gave parties, you had to have someone stationed at the end of the hall to open the door so people could come into your onto your floor. So that I think I think that only lasted for three years. We ended up using the Madison Inn on the fourth year, which was nearby the convention hotel mm -hmm. um, facility. But then the next year we moved downtown to the Concourse Hotel, which is where the convention is is now. That didn't last too long. That didn't last too long because the hotel didn't the hotel management at the time didn't feel like science fiction fans were professional enough in their attire. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yes, that it was, was only three years at at the with the yeah. university system. And then we um, because of the disadvantages. And then we moved to that suburban uh, location that you remember, Lucy, which was, and finally we moved back to the concourse, which is where most of the, most of the, most of the Wisconsin have taken place since then, or all of them since then. I, I have to say, in the 2000s, not going to Wisconsin was kind of like missing out on Burning Man. <laughs> Everybody you knew was going, and everyone came back with these astonishing stories. It was a great it was, it was amazing, especially by Wisconsin 20, I'd say that anyone that considered themselves part of the feminist science fiction community, even tangentially, either was there or wanted to be there. We got so many requests. Can you give me a transcript of all your part of all your, all your programs? <laughs> and we had to say, sorry, that's just, we don't have that. Maybe they do now since they had to do Zoom stuff for the pandemic. Um, panels but yeah during the the the, the Wisconsin 20s was amazing the, the, so many things changed with that convention and made it more welcoming and open we we started we, we we offered free child to care for the first time it was something that we should have done much earlier but we finally got it done and we opened up the the, the, the program planning to basically the world we 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 started cloud crowd search crowdsourcing the panels and that had its advantages and disadvantages the main advantage was that it made our program so cutting edge whatever people were talking about and excited about and arguing about happened had a had a had a place to be had a, had a panel involved in, involved with it the difficult part was that as we opened up the 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 planning committee and the uh, and the programming to the whole world to everyone in the in the science fiction uh, feminist community they all these people also took ownership of the convention they 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 they, they wanted more than just a a place at the panelist table. And for the most part, I think that was excellent. With, with, with Wisconsin 23, we, we started really working hard at making the convention more open and making it more diverse. We set up, we set up rooms for people of color to start planning how 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 to how to change Wisconsin and make make it make it more open. And that that had a huge effect on the convention. Um, we, we made accessibility a really important important part of, of the convention in terms of how uh, how the um well I don't want to go into detail but so many things happened during those 20s that radically changed the changed the convention and 
ended up making some people in the Madison group feel um, out of place. That was that's that was the worst part, I think. Even though we accepted panel ideas from anyone, and the and you could and anybody could sign up for a panel, we weren't discriminating. There were there were people in the Madison group who who said we don't feel um, um, like when I'm trying to think of the word when 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 you when when, when you don't have the proper expertise. I'm sorry, I don't I can't think of the word. And and that that changed Wisconsin's character into something that I think fandom at large felt they owned in a way, and the local fans owned less. When when Wisconsin started, when Jan and I started in the the first the first few concoms, one of the main things that happened during our concom meetings is that we'd be we'd be talking about panels. We, Jan or I, or somebody else had read a book and said, we should have a panel on this idea. And we'd spend half or more of the, the, the meeting tossing ideas. In fact, for a while, for several years, we once a month, we had, we opened up, we, we advertised our meetings to the general public in Madison and, and did a program and as sort of a, of a, a rehearsal for a Wiscon panel. One year, one, one, one month, for instance, we did, will the real T James Tiptree Jr. please stand up? We did it as a to tell the truth panel, kind of as a comedy kind of routine. And, it, and it, then we made it into an event at, at, at Wiscon. But at, at, after the beginning of the 20s, more and more of the most um, highly regarded, more, more, more most exciting Wiscon panels came from the outside because authors or editors or readers had gotten involved in kind of controversy <laughs> and wanted to bring it to the head, bring it to, to a head at the convention. And I think that's, what's, that, that's what made Wisconsin so exciting for uh, a much bigger population than just Madison or, or, or our region. <laughs> 